I always have to fill the awkward silence whilst uh, we're waiting. I can see participants joining, but John, what, what's the weather like where you are at the moment? Where I am currently? Yeah. Very grey. Grey. Very grey, which is a bit of a shame, but yeah, it's, it's a bit grey and rainy, but I think we've been really blessed, haven't we, with uh, good weather, especially as we can like, actually go out and do stuff and then obviously go indoors as well next week. Yeah, that'd be exciting. So I can already see, um, you'll be able to see, John, that there's lots of participants already joining um, us. So that's great. So welcome, everybody. And um, thanks for joining us on this um, cloudy grey um, Thursday day. Um, it's definitely grey and cloudy in London. Um, we'll just give it a couple more minutes, uh, I think, until we start, just to make sure that everybody's had time to, to log in. Um, and then we'll get going on today's webinar, which is going to be hosted by John. Looking forward to it, guys. Looking forward to leading you through, uh, yeah, how to maximize the value of Icon. So just give that, yeah, a couple more minutes. How many uh, attendees are we on at the moment? I obviously can't see it, unfortunately, at the moment. Oh, can you not? Yeah, no. it's cranking up. We've got around um, 20 so far. Brilliant. Um, yeah, so, so that's great. Actually, I think... I know time is precious, um, so should we should we crack on? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so um, as John uh, has said, thank you so much for uh, coming to today's webinar. Um, John's going to be running us through um, the uh, presentation slides and giving us some really really useful insight into how to get the maximum value out of iQuant. So just a brief introduction as to who John and I are. Um, terrible photos here um, of myself, not just you, John. <laughs> but um, yeah, just to introduce ourselves, I'm the CMO at iQuant um, and um, we at iQuant host these masterclasses um, every now and then just to do a deeper dive into uh, the latest innovations and developments in artificial um, uh, intelligence and predictive eye tracking data. So um, John, as our product specialist today, is going to be helping us understand how we can get even more from uh, iQuant. Uh, so if you're an existing customer, it's going to be really useful to say, to think about, okay, how else can I be using it? Are there other teams that can be um, taking advantage of the predictive analytics? And if you're not yet a customer, it's going to be really interesting to understand. Actually, there's a huge opportunity for me to understand and start incorporating some of this predictive data into your workflows. Um, this session is recorded, so if you have to drop off at any point, don't worry. We're going to record it and send it out later. Um, and if you've got any questions, feel free to add them on um, in the Q&A section um, at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to be manning that and responding where I can, and at the end, um, we can have a Q&A section um, once we've gone through the majority of the content. So really looking forward to this. Over to you, John. Brilliant. Thank you, Lorna. Um, yeah, guys, that's one thing that I will, will say as well. I think um, it's very much an opportunity for you guys to work out or sort of understand, I should say, how best to be using iQuant to be getting the most out of it. And also as an introductory to those of you who are not yet clients of ours. Um, I think the most important part is that you guys do feel comfortable asking us questions as well. Um, it's, this is really an opportunity to make sure that your understanding, I guess, is as robust as possible coming away from this. So if it's a question in general, please feel free to ask. If there's anything even that you don't feel that I've explained sufficiently or that you want a little bit more clarification on, again, please feel free to ask that because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that everyone is comfortable uh, with the information that they're being presented with today. So in terms of, I think, the biggest things that are most important to take away today is how you can be using iQuant to make yourselves as effective as possible. Now, the biggest bit of feedback that we've got is very much sort of around things such as ROI and how to convert very strong digital performance. Conversely as well, what we're here to do is to make sure that we can help you reduce this wastage as well. So in 2019, what you can see here, it was estimated that $130 billion were wasted on digital performance spend due to poor visibility. And iQuant is here to help you understand how to harness 
that visibility, and at the end of the day, convert it and create the ultimate digital experiences. So our mission is obviously to become the de facto standard for AI guided design and data before you launch to help you increase those conversion rates and again, improve that digital ROI. The main thing that I want to make sure that everyone gets out of today is really to remember the idea of iQuant as data before you launch. Where iQuant really shines is as a predictive design AI. The other part of that as well is to remove any misconceptions around what iQuant can be specifically used for. So people tend to see iQuant sometimes and think, oh, this is just to be used on landing pages, web pages to tell me where people are looking in the first three to five seconds. And the other thing, as well as data before you launch that I really want to be taken away from today, is that iQuant can be used for any visual medium that you are using to communicate with your clients. So that can be web and landing pages, of course, but also letters, emails. We have clients who use them for pizza menus, for example, in Italy. So what I'm going to go into more detail about the use cases for that, but that's the other thing that I really want you guys to remember, that you can use iQuant for any visual medium that you are communicating through your clients to, through to your clients, I should say. So iQuant empowers decisions during the design process before we go live. So what you can see here on the right-hand side of the page are some questions that you can help answer whilst you're doing your due diligence, your A-B testing, any multivariate testing that you're doing to ensure that when we hit going live, that you can be confident that it's going to perform exactly the way that you want it to. So iQuant can be used right from hypothesizing all the way to building and then testing before you go live. And then, yeah, you can absolutely continue to launch, uh, monitor it after you've launched it. But the biggest way that iQuant stands out and can help you be as effective as possible is in this pre-launch phase. So what you can see here is obviously quite a handy flowchart in terms of how typically our clients use it throughout the creative process. And I think the other thing as well that I want to highlight here is you can see obviously an example down here of where it fits in your design toolbox. Icon is not a one size fits all tool. It's not something that's used just by design teams. It's not used by just Crow teams. It's used in many different ways by essentially anyone who has an input into a visual way that you're communicating with your clients. So again, we're gonna come into onto more detail with that in terms of the use case side of things. But again, that's the main, one of the other main things I want to be taken away from this session today, that Icon is not a one size fits all tool used by just design teams, it can be used by anyone that has that input into visual communication with clients. So, to introduce Icon, obviously in more detail, Icon is a predictive AI that provides analyses of digital experiences. Now, what you can see here are some of the outputs of Icon and the different ways that will present the information to you. But to give you a little bit of background as to how Icon was put together. So we work very closely with the University of Osnabrück and we work with their chief scientist over there who conduct these eye tracking studies. And what we've done is we've built within the system, our tech team, artificial neural networks. And what these do is they essentially simulate lab studies as if someone was being sat on a stool in front of a team of scientists, having designs held up in front of them and where they're looking in the first three to five seconds being tracked. So what the ANNs will do within seconds is simulate thousands of lab studies like that to provide you with that feedback. It's available online in the form of a Chrome plugin. So there's no integration required. Once you have the Chrome plugin installed, you can instantly start analyzing experiences on iQuant. The other thing that I'll say very quickly there is that iQuant analyzes what you put in front of it. So if you bring up um, a high fidelity wireframe, for example, on your screen, iQuant will analyze what you're looking at. And essentially what it's helping you do is measuring key elements for visibility and the overall perception of the design. So just to go into a little bit of detail as to how the information is presented to you. Now, what, what we've got here are the, is the perception map, the hotspots, regions of interest, attention map, and design metrics. 
Now, the first two with these design metrics are our clarity and excitingness scores. Now, the clarity score measures how clean and clear a design is. The correlation there is that a higher clarity score ensures a lower bounce rate. And an excitingness score measures how visually stimulating a design is. Now, the excitingness score allows you to be a little bit creative within the type of narrative you're trying to convey. So to give you an example, I do a lot of work with finance and insurance institutions. And one of our insurance clients in the UK, legal in general, was sending out letters about life insurance. So we did a session where they sent the email templates over to me. I ran them through iQuant and they came up with very high clarity scores, but low excitingness scores. And I think a trap that a lot of people fall into is they assume that a low excitingness score equals bad. It doesn't, it merely means karma. So if you are putting together letters on life insurance or landing pages, aiming for a lower excitingness score is actually probably more appropriate. So I would really encourage those of you that already have access to iQuant and those of you that are trying to understand iQuant in more detail to think about how malleable you can make the excitingness scores within the type of message that you're trying to convey. As you can see here, obviously, as I was about to say, here are some of the uh, metrics that we'll present you with. So this is a perception map on the top left here. Very simply, it shows you what's gonna be seen and missed in the first three to five seconds. Everything in white is what is seen. Everything in black is what is missed. Here is an attention map, which obviously takes more of a heat map approach. And this shows you what is holding people's attention in that first three to five seconds. So that's the main thing as well that I really want to stand out here. Iquant covers the first three to five seconds of looking at something. Obviously the areas that are hotter here and thus these darker red and oranges are what are holding the most attention. The um, other two, so the hotspots show you what are the most standout areas on the page. And then down here, we've also got the regions of interest. And the regions of interest measure the attention across a group of pixels against the page average. Now the page average starts at zero, which means that the percentage numbers that you get as feedback here on different regions, calls to action, hero images can be 100, 150%, but also can be sub zero because they're trying to understand how they're performing within a visual hierarchy. So that's kind of the way that we would present the information to you and how you can get feedback on it. And then from a more in-depth perspective, this is something that is covered in training sessions when we sort of sit down with you and run through some designs that you may have. So in just terms before, yeah, okay. sorry, just before we go on, um, we've had a question submitted. Um, it also gives you a chance for a, a little break as well. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, interesting um, on the excitingness score. Yeah. Could you give a few, few more examples of where low excitingness scores could be beneficial? Absolutely, yes. So one of the big ones is obviously the legal and general example in terms of um, sending letters out about life insurance. One of the other ones that really stands out is when uh, we work with JLL, um, obviously a finance institution, and they were doing work on balance pages. So sort of just logging in and having a look at what your balance is. Again, um, that's not something that needs to be a particularly stimulating experience because it's essentially just numbers on a page, but it does need to be clear. So if so, the way that they approached it was that they had very sort of I would say quite minimalist calls to action. So log in, click here, account at the top, and then the balance in the middle of the page. And this was black text on a white background, which was obviously very standout and something that creates that clip, that clarity, but isn't necessarily that exciting or stimulating to look at. So balance pages in terms of financial institutions is a good example of that. And conversely, higher excitingness scores tends to be very um, popular with e-commerce clients. Um, so Unilever, for example, we work with their CMI and Shopper Insights teams over there. And in terms of, particularly for mobile, making sure that when they're working with, on, on Dove, for example, having a lot of stimulating in imagery on there, calls to action, information about discounts, delivery, because obviously with COVID, at the moment, I know shops are opening up in the UK, but broad brush shops are closed. They want people to still be stimulated by the idea of online shopping and still um, 
engaging with them and buying from them from an e-commerce perspective and converting that attention. So for e-commerce, high excitingness scores tend to be quite effective, um, but certainly, yeah, for lower excitingness scores, it's most appropriate when you're communicating quite a serious, I, would say, I wouldn't say serious actually, quite a clear message that is very black and white, if that makes sense. So around life insurance and balances. I, I hope that kind of makes sense and answers the question. Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. The other thing to add is that we have actually done um, research per sectors. So for excitingness and clarity score, we've got an average score per sector. And as John says, there is huge variations um, in what the average um, score is for those industries, uh, which is super interesting. But also, I think the, the other point is it depends where the, the user is in their user journey. So naturally, if you created a really stimulating, exciting um, landing page um, or the beginning of the journey, you've, you've captured their attention. But if you want them to convert um, by adding something to their cart, hugely stimulating um, user experiences can often cause a bit too much cognitive load. And we want to make it very, very simple for, for people to make a decision very quickly during that specific stage the customer journey. So we can send around a link to the uh, benchmark report that shows the averages and it, it gives some live examples of who's who's got really, really exciting and stimulating designs and who's actually focusing on much calmer and clearer designs. Brilliant. Thank you, Lorna. So yeah, so to go back to obviously how iQuant works as well, um, we've touched upon the ANNs earlier, but what, what iQuant's platform does is it instantly generates visual and emotional simulations of how users will perceive things such as digital ads, websites, landing pages, social media posts, and newsletters. Again, anything visual that you're using to communicate with your clients can be used uh, in tandem with iQuant. And obviously we wouldn't be able to, I mean, I don't think anyone would be able to use human participants for every single analysis, but what the ANNs are there to do is to have that neuroscientific model of human attention that achieves over 92% predictive accuracy. So what the ANNs do is they simulate these studies. And what I will say as well, as I've been asked this before, how often do you update this? You know, when do we go back? And the answer is constantly. We're constantly tweaking the UI. We're constantly tweaking the way that the information is presented. Um, this isn't a one and done study. Um, it's something that's constantly being looked into, tweaked and updated. Um, and it's something that we're very committed to making sure that we maintain this over 92% predictive accuracy. Um, another question that I've had as well, or another example, sorry, of when we've updated the UI to make sure that we're staying up to date is again with Unilever. Now I mentioned, obviously they were doing uh, from an e-commerce shopper insights perspective, uh, mobile. Um, in terms of how people are mainly shopping now. And they called it CoronaVision. And this is something that we have to be aware of, um, that there is that shift, particularly in e-commerce habits to shop online and also on mobile. So this is something that we obviously take into account. We work in tandem with our clients to make sure that we're providing as accurate feedback as possible. And we always encourage open dialogues with something like this. Um, I frequently have clients coming to me and saying, I ran this analysis, but it doesn't quite make sense to me. Can we hop on a call to investigate in more detail? And from there, we're very lucky as well as we, and so far we can reach out to our tech team directly to get feedback. And it's again about that transparency that we're always updating the UI um, to make sure that we're continuously hitting these heights here. So to clarify then, in terms of how iQuant can help you, um, and again, reduce any wastage in terms of spend. iQuant helps you do things such as validate design direction, use our best in class AI to optimize digital performance, reduce time spent on subjective stakeholder feedback. So that's a really big one that we always get is iQuant is very frequently used as a justification tool. Um, I'm sure those of you that work uh, sort of in design or in Crow or UX have been in some mind numbing discussions before where you debate the color of a button. Uh, someone doesn't like red, but someone else does and you don't really have anything to back it up at bar occasionally having subjective discussions. iQuant lets you download your um, 
analyses as PDFs, PowerPoints, or zip files, so that you actually have that information to take forward, uh, and it helps speed up sign-off. And then, yeah, the other two, obviously, improving that digital ROI and reducing experiment and design iteration loops. It helps you understand what works, helps you emulate that, and helps you just have a really solid understanding of how best to communicate with your clients visually. I've just seen a couple of um, things flash up at the bottom, Lorna. Are there any questions at the moment as well? Uh, no, I just shared the um, link to the benchmark report in the chat. Um, and uh, I'm just, there's a question about the presentation being recorded um, and also the slides. So yeah. yeah, we'll send them. This is being recorded and um, no worries if you have to log off. Um, beforehand, we will send the recording as soon as it's um, downloaded from the cloud, um, yeah. along with uh, the presentation deck as well, so you can take a longer look at some of the content and examples. Exactly. Thank you. So moving on from obviously understanding how Icon can help you solve these problems, a lot of feedback, particularly when speaking to clients that we, we get is that, as I said, it's not a one size fits all tool, right? It is very much, and again, this is the, one of the most important bits to highlight, a predictive design AI. And I think, especially with Icon, which is a very collaborative tool, especially working from home as well, people want to be using it in a collaborative and effective way so that when people are making design decisions, you're making them as a team. And when you are having these little victories, you can share them as a team as well. So if I just go back, sorry, um, when should we be using iQuant? So as I've highlighted a few times now, iQuant can be used in any visual medium that you're using to communicate with your clients. Um, iQuant is not here to just be a website evaluation tool or a um, landing page tool. can absolutely, don't get me wrong, be used for that. But where it really stands out is, again, from that predictive side of things. And it can be used across a variety of different manners. So app development and optimization, so improving that UX. We work very closely with Diageo on their My Diageo app to help them understand how they can put the best calls to action on there. Email promotion to increase CTR. So an example of email promotion um, would be one of our clients, Profusion, who are working very closely with Screwfix. Um, and they really were sort of using it to push obviously discounts, send those out to clients. It's a very useful and very unique use, use case. Website Crow to increase sales and improve UX. Unilever, as I touched upon earlier in their adaptation to Corona vision. Um, asset creation, so improving creative performance and reducing costs associated with ineffective creative. This is used by all of our clients in this way, sitting down, running iQuant uh, analyses and actually having that tangible feedback and when you start clicking the download button, those of you who are already clients, I know a few of you do already, you'll see that the PDF doesn't just regurgitate what has already been said. It will contextualize the information, give you that really handy piece of feedback so that when you are working in asset creation, you can improve creative performance across the board. And finally, stakeholder management as well. Just getting things signed off faster, as I touched upon earlier. Icon is a really, really useful justification tool for a lot of our clients. Um, and it really helps them understand in more detail what's working, but also what's not working. And it means that less time is spent debating uh, and more time creating. So here is an example of, I guess, five of the most standout data points that influence human attention the most that we found. And again, I'm just going to take a second to reiterate that Iquant is here to analyze the first three to five seconds of saying something. So these include things such as page layout, contrast, text size, color, and faces. These are the things which tend to have the most impact on where people are gonna look, and are also the areas that stand out the most from an attention perspective. I'll just very quickly highlight here text. Now, from a privacy and linguistic standpoint, iQuant doesn't read the text that you put into it. So it won't evaluate separate words. It won't say that this word will perform better than others. Iquant merely looks at text as a design tool. So that includes text font, text size, text color, the type of background that it's on. Iquant will merely look at text as a design tool. It won't read and evaluate it from a linguistic perspective. 
that's just something that we get asked every now and again when people are working on um you know asset creation that can be quite you know sort of having to sign ndas to work on it and it's not something that we read we don't store the kind of text that you put in either so to come on, I guess, to the, the real meat of things here and understanding from a usage, usage case perspective where Icon can really help you is the first thing that we obviously know and need to understand. And again, this comes into more detail as to how we consistently tweak the UI and we have to understand the habits of not only our users, but everyone. Currently, obviously, adults are spending more than a quarter of their working day online, which is the highest on record. So what Icon is here to help you do is essentially not lose people and bore people. It's important to craft compelling digital experiences to keep people engaged with you specifically. And obviously a big reason for this is remote working and it's forced UX specialists to look for new data-driven solutions like what Icon can offer. So this user testing and eye tracking studies, but they are no longer necessarily the only option to take forward. So, what iQuant does, again, that simulation, is you can see that iQuant will predict, our prediction here on the right is as accurate, 91%, I should say, as accurate as running an eye tracking experiment with 46 participants. So our clients no longer have to rely on things such as guerrilla marketing or guerrilla testing, I should say. They don't have to rely on having to sit people down. iQuant lets them work quickly and efficiently from home. Now, the main sort of use cases that we have. So as I've touched upon, we have a number of clients who use it in a different way. And Icon is not here to be a one size fits all tool. So it's not, we're not gonna stop here and say, Icon for UX designers and researchers, that's it. Here are a few different examples of the ways that people use it. So Icon lets UX designers and researchers ideate and test design hypotheses instantly. So what it helps them do is it helps them understand where attention is gonna be, perception is gonna be, and also to an extent emotion through the excitingness uh, score. Through these different maps and these different scores, it will help you revise prototypes based on data. So when you have this quantitative, or, yeah, qual no, qualitative data, readily available to you, it will help you ensure your most compelling designs are the ones that go live. And again, when you've got multiple elements on a page up for debate, Iquant lets you run multivariate tests. So you can pit the two or three against the, each other. Um, it's really popularly used at an A-B testing stage. Um, you can help understand how the position of a sign up form, CTA or imagery will affect things. Um, and it will help you understand before you go live how you can best achieve those design goals. You can also then benchmark high fidelity wireframes and prototypes. And you can also do this against your nearest competitors to ensure that you're doing your due diligence. And it will help you make sure that you capture attention in a way that will again, set you apart, especially when people are spending so much time, the highest on record online. So you'll be able to make sure that you can understand how you can be set apart from your competitors. And it will just help you understand as well these design elements that are causing high cognitive load and preventing users from converting. So again, just to touch very briefly on what we discussed earlier, there is a direct correlation between a high clarity score and a lower bounce rate. Because if something is clean and clear, people are more likely to stay on the page, not get confused, and then not bounce off the page. So that's how, from a top-down perspective, UX designers and researchers can use it. For BI and performance management specialists, what it helps them, sorry, how it helps them is that whether they're using things such as fusion charts, uh, high charts, data wrapper, or basically any data visualization tool, it will help provide a way, so ICOM will help provide a way for teams to understand patterns and data. And What's so important is making sure that the most important data is the most accessible. So while they might not be looking to necessarily drive action, the most important data needs to be instantly visible. 
And what they can do is they can use iQuant to see which things such as charts, gra graphs, and maps are grabbing attention so that the most valuable data is standing out. And JLL with their balance pages and the way that they use it for dashboards as well is a really good example of that because they want to make sure that on those dashboards, especially that the right charts and graphs are immediately visible, that they're not scrolling through the page, trying to find what they need to look at, that it's right there in the first three to five seconds. It just helps these BI um, and performance management specialists work efficiently. You can also do cross device testing from that perspective, because it's so important to test dashboards on a mobile bro or browser, sorry, to ensure users can see the most important data while on the go. And it's especially important if you're using something as dynamic dashboards, for example. And what you can do as well is you can create high fidelity mockups to facilitate discussions with data users to surface and prioritize issues, requirements, and solutions, most importantly. What iQuant does, so I've touched upon iQuant as a justification tool. It's also a great time-saving tool as well. So when you're looking for a solution, iQuant can help you cut that time right down to ensure that you're working quickly, efficiently, and that we've touched upon digital wastage, but also I guess, you know, of course you guys don't wanna be wasting your time as well, especially working from home, you want to make sure that it's being spent efficiently. So iQuant helps you do that, and you can use iQuant scores to prove or dis disprove dashboard design hypotheses. Now, the next use case is iQuant for product management and development teams. Now, the thing here is that turning a marketable idea, uh, sorry, turning an idea into a marketable product is a complex and multifaceted process. There's a lot of subjectivity in something like this, a fair bit of sign off that would be needed, um, and also a lot of input from different parts of businesses. And what iQuant helps you do with our analytics is tie all that together so that development teams can start building digital products with greater insight and confidence. So again, there's that message of pre-launch, making sure that you're maximizing your efficiency. So how this helps is you can cut launch time, um, use iQuant to turn sketches, fully design mock-ups into digital products that again, capture attention, it will help you prove viability with quantifiable user attention, and it will drive innovation. So you can initiate UX discussions with our attention data. iQuant is a very collaborative tool, excuse me, as well as not necessarily being a one size fits all tool. So it will help you share prototypes with customers, users, and stakeholders to instantly incorporate ideas. And again, there's that idea of doing your pre-launch due diligence to make sure that you're acting as effectively as possible. And Again, it really helps that collaboration so that you guys can deliver user-centric experiences across brands, categories, and campaigns. And then what we've also got here is how iQuant can be used for digital marketers and Crow teams. So as we touched upon earlier, humans are spending at the moment the most time on record online, the highest. Um, Conversely, funnily enough, what that means is that our attention span has kind of plummeted. Um, so with the fact that our attention span now is at an all time low, we need to, I guess you guys would need to make sure that your target audience will read things such as long blog posts with large blocks of text, essentially, that you can really make sure people stay engaged and stay with you on that customer journey. And what iQuant helps you do is ideate campaign ideas to make sure that the content that you're putting out is grabbing attention. So the perception and attention maps, the hotspots and regions of interest data are crucial for any Crow team to create an effective visual hierarchy. So when you're putting information together and you've got your design metrics on the page and different design elements, the important thing to remember is that obviously they are competing against each other within a visual hierarchy. And it helps you understand how these different design elements are competing for attention and helps you structure the type of visual hierarchy that you want to create. And thus, obviously, overarchingly, the type of message that you're trying to create. You can also run rapid tests to highlight or remove blockers in the user journey. And with our predictive eye tracking data, it will help you understand how this content is going to be viewed. This will help you optimize the designs. And we can also predict from a display ad perspective what is going to be seen pre-launch. So that's kind of an example with these last four here, how different design, digital marketing, Crow, uh, BI teams would use it. 
And that's what I really want to highlight, that it's not a one size fits all tool. It's a very collaborative tool as well. And it's meant to provide you with a informative, overarching narrative pre-launch as to how your designs are going to perform. Before I come on to the next couple of steps, obviously having talked through those use cases, does anyone have any questions at the moment? Or is there anything I didn't explain properly, for example? Would you like any more examples? Um, the Q&A box was pinging, it was on fire. Um, the mm. questions were more around um, the accuracy, um, which um, I've answered um, and we can send. Um, Yes. Just, to, just to clarify, we referenced uh, on average a 92% accuracy score and then on one of the um, slides there was a 91% accuracy. Um, that 91% relates to that specific study of I think 46% of 46 participants, but on average the computational models um, have that 92% uh, accuracy, accuracy score. So there's also some um, information on the website around how accurate iQuant is and some of the methods and processes that we take um, in order to ensure that we are um, achieving the very highest standards. Um, and then there was another question around um, seeing a live example of the PDF. So I've suggested that we can share that uh, an example export uh, as an attachment to the email as a follow up as well. Definitely. But, but that, that's it so far, but feel free. I'm mean, loving to see the, the interaction and the huge variety in the questions that have been submitted. So keep uh, raising your hand. If you'd like to speak, I can throw over the mic to you. Or if you want to submit another question, um, go, go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, guys. Um, and then, yeah, coming on to this side of things. So this is an example, obviously, of some of the clients that we work with at the moment. Um, and what is, again, I know I've, I've reiterated this a few times, is that it's a variety of different teams. So we don't work with just design teams at Unilever, Diageo, RB or, you know, Audi. It's very much the CMI and Shopper Insights teams, as I've mentioned with Unilever, and we've recently expanded into their Kick team as well. Um, Diageo is used um, by their internal agency from a design perspective, but also their digital marketing teams. Um, Lego use it very much for packaging, um, for digital ads. Google very much focused on the digital ad side of things. Um, and Reprise, for example, use it for their SEO teams. So they all sit with different teams, but the and and which is really great to see. And as when we get provided with brilliant case studies and, and different use cases from them as well. But the important thing to remember here as well, that the consistency there is that all these teams that I've mentioned, whilst they sit in different teams, they are all people who have an input into the visual manner within which they communicate with their clients. And that is what I would really encourage everyone to take away from it. So, you know, if you're someone that doesn't necessarily work in a digital marketing team or design, if you're sort of thinking, well, how would I use something like this? I hope this has been a little bit clearer to you. And iQuant can be used, as I said, by anyone who has any input into the visual presentation or messages to your clients. Um, we've obviously touched upon the fact that it can be used digitally, but we have, as I said, it can be used for offline content as well. So we have obviously letters. Um, we have pizzerias in Italy who use it for pizza menus. Um, and again, unique use cases, but again, that's a visual piece of communication they're having with customers. So if you've got any sort of input or any sort of desire for a deeper understanding as to how your visual message is being perceived and then moving from that, Icon will be able to help you with that. We've just had a very, very good um, question submitted from another John. Um, it's a little, I don't know whether it's a little bit cheeky, but it's made me smile. Has today's presentation been uh, pre-Zoom Iquanted? <laughs> um, so the short answer is not specifically this one. However, what this presentation is based off is from an account management perspective, the um, training that I conduct twice a year with every single client, both from an onboarding and a refresher perspective. And some of these slides have been run through Iquant before. Yeah, this one in particular here. Um, 
the placing of some of these are very deliberate because when we run these through a perception map, we want to make sure that, you know, we're not just getting dead space come up as the first three to five seconds. So short answer, no, but a few slides on this, including this one, yeah, have been run through ICON. Um, and it's I definitely it's a cheeky it, question. I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a very interesting use case. Um, I know uh, huge corporates spend thousands uh, on uh, presentation development uh, by outsourcing it to agencies. So um, a lot of the agencies that you can see here will be creating sales collateral, including PowerPoints, including brochures, and that will have been eye quanted. It's just that you probably won't necessarily know that because that's part of their um, kind of value proposition that they will use to, to provide that service. Um, but you can definitely use it um, for um, PowerPoint optimization to ensure that the key messages are really resonating. Definitely. And, I, and I, what I actually like about that question, John, is that you've actually really understood one of the key takeaways from today. Anything, because this is a way in which I'm visually communicating with all of you now. Um, so you've clearly understood that it can be used for any sort of visual message that you're trying to convey to people. So yeah, absolutely. If you do, as, as Lorna said, want to run sales collateral through I want uh, PowerPoints, et cetera, you can absolutely do that. So that's actually a really good question because it shows that I must have, I've, I've probably explained it correctly then in the variety of different ways you can use it. So thank you for that. Um, and we've just got a bit of a testimony here from uh, JLL, who I mentioned earlier, who were one of our very much standout clients. And we work with them closely on things such as case studies. Um, we, you know, I've conducted quite a few training sessions with them now with their global team. They have a global license with us. And how they use it is very unique but also very interesting. So they use it for analytics dashboards as well as balance pages. And it just makes sure that they can quantify the impact their design changes have on user retention. Because when you're accessing that kind of information, it needs to be immediately available. It needs to be clean, it needs to be clear, and it needs to be that people can go on there and within that first three to five seconds, it's clear what they need to be looking at. And they very much focus on clarity score. So again, measuring how clean and clear something is, and they share these with agencies and other departments to communicate how color, contrast, branded elements and layout can all negatively affect the visualization of data. And the thing is with that as well is that this bit really stands out. We share with our agencies and other departments to communicate. Iquan is a very, very collaborative tool. And by communicating clearly and being able to have that understanding and that understanding of visual attention backed up by data, helps you work more efficiently across different teams and different mediums to make sure that you are converting attention how you want to. So again, that's something that I'd really highlight is not a one size fits all tool, very collaborative tool as well. And what we've got here as well, so what I focused on today, what we focused on I should say, sorry, is Iquant Inspect. And this is for static imagery. And this is for uploading design files, entering URLs, and understanding within seconds how people's attention is gonna be converted, or, or sorry, Sahanis free to being converted. We've also got our video analysis tool, Experience, and this helps you understand things such as customer scrolling journeys and literal attention on videos. So this, is, this slide here is to show you that we haven't just done one study 10 years ago with the University of Osnabrück and thought that's good enough to, to build a business around, to build a consistent narrative around for our clients. We are constantly updating the UI. We are constantly trying to understand different ways in which people are consuming information, but also how we can prevent, present sorry, this um, information back to you. And a big one has been iPoint experience. Uh, so as I mentioned, it can be used for customer scrolling journeys, but also for video. So you can literally hit play on a video and it will show you where people are looking. Um, to give an example of this, one of our agency clients, GTB in the US, worked very closely with Ford on their shop front, um, and they wanted to understand where they should be putting different calls to action in terms of Ford's cars online, and they did it in two ways. So they did it in terms of scrolling through the website and understanding where people were looking, and also car adverts themselves. So. I'm sure you're all familiar to a degree with um, how car websites present themselves. You always have a banner ad of the actual vehicle itself, be that a video or be that a photo or even sort of a slideshow. 
And one thing that they were really hot on was understanding how that bit at the top was performing. And um, they did that through literally hitting play on a video and understanding where people would be looking on that. Um, so Icon Experience is our video analysis tool and then Icon Captivate as well. This helps you understand and measure whether display ads will catch the attention of the viewer by measuring its salience in a decisive moment. So again, it's about that conversion and making sure that you're making the most of customer attention. So that kind of obviously concludes then the presentation side of things. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, if there's any other questions, thoughts, ideas, or even if I haven't explained something correctly, I think that's the biggest thing that I want this information to be as clear as possible. You know, please feel free to obviously flag that up. Now. I mean, that silence might mean that I've done my job, but. Yeah, I think you've done a great job. I think um, the different use cases and those real life examples have been really, really valuable. Um, and as a reminder of how um, versatile the analytics are, um, just a final point on um, that, that last slide. If anybody's got any questions or anybody would like to see um, a demo, um, just let us know and we'll book that in um, and gladly walk you through some of the latest um, developments, but also give you a glance as to what's coming as well. So um, we'll share with you the product roadmap so that you can see um, some of that innovation um, in the prototype form as well. Uh, we often run sessions to, to get customers to feed in. Um, well, we have got a question. I've got a feeling that Michael may be extremely technical. So Michael's question is, um, yeah. a great presentation in the video frame by frame um, or a 25 FPS video, uh, well done. Um, so the, the video that's in this frame right now is a GIF. So um, we're, we've obviously slowed down the actual replay. Um, so that's what you're seeing there. I've um, got another question saying, um, how is Captivate different from Inspect and in, and Experience? Mm. Okay, so just very quickly, sorry, on that very first one from Michael, it's a good, good question because when you are doing the customer scrolling journey, just very quickly, and I'll come to the next question in a second. When you're doing the customer scrolling journey, obviously we've slowed it down, but you can scroll as fast or as slow as you like on that to understand how different parts of the page are gonna be performing. So from that kind of perspective, you're very much in control about how you wanna do that. Um, now the two, now in terms of the actual difference, so Captivate is for display ads. So that's what it's for. It's static imagery, but it's specifically geared towards display ads. Inspect is also static imagery, but is very much for other types of visual communication. So letters, emails, website landing pages. It can be used for display ads and the way the information is presented to you is different. So this helps you understand, you can see here, the different ways in which it's gonna be seen. Whereas if you run it through inspect, you'll get feedback from a clarity and excitingness score perspective, also things such as perception maps, hotspots, regions of interest, et cetera, which you won't get on Captivate. Experience is different from the other two because that's video analysis. So the easiest way to remember it is static for inspect, video uh, for experience, and Captivate is specifically for display ads. Um, Lorna, you're probably in a better position than I to expand on display, uh, expand on Captivate and how it's different from inspect. But those are the main two immediately. I mean, I guess you could go into a tiny bit more detail to make sure that it's as clear as possible. Yeah, so I think the what we don't see here um, is the main difference in the data that's powering the insights. So um, the data for powering Captivate has been specifically designed for um, banner ads um, and, and display ads there. So. What that calculates is the global saliency and likely viewability of that ad. Um, and uh, it gives you that specific score. Whereas um, Inspect, um, as we've seen throughout the presentation, gives you um, very, very thorough breakdowns and deep dives into attention, uh, perception, regions of interest. 
um, so that you can diagnose certain elements around attention. Uh, there's also different um, algorithms working within Inspect, so you can choose whether it's a new user or a returning user. You can um, easily toggle to, to optimize for mobile designs as well. So all of that data um, is has been uh, collected um, in experiments that are relevant to that experience. So that's where that's where you can trust that data um, and you get different outputs as a result of it. And then experience, um, as we've said, um, that's um, been uh, calculated based on uh, motion um, and um, free viewing um, eye tracking studies. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're able then to um, analyze um, different user journeys and the impact that motion has. Um, a clear differentiator is you will, not, you will not see the same results from inspect as you will in experience because we, we haven't simply taken uh, the algorithm behind um, the static analyses and then applied it per frame because that's not how the brain works. The brain doesn't process that volume of information um, in, in that way. So there is certain um, calculations and that have been applied to that. But hands up, I'm not a, a neurobiology, I'm not a neuro or data scientist. We have the privilege of working with some exceptionally talented people who live and breathe this area. So if anybody would like to, to know even more information around uh, the, the kind of technical side of things, then we can definitely even host a webinar doing a deep dive into the technology because it sounds like that's something that's quite interesting. Exactly. And I think, yeah, that, that's something that I would highlight as well, is that we're very lucky insofar as we frequently have open and honest dialogues with our tech team. And they're extremely accommodating in terms of providing that extra bit of, I suppose, technical clarification uh, for things such as this. So one thing I always encourage our clients to do is when they have technical questions to send them over to me. And I'm very lucky insofar as I can just go to our tech team and ask them about it and, and get that clarification, because I think that's the biggest thing with something like this as well is, is transparency and understanding the information that you're being presented with and why you're getting these results as well. Cool. I, th I think that's it for the questions. Yes. Um, thanks so much, John. Um, really, really useful session. It sounds like we've answered a lot of questions and it sounds like um, we've been able to hopefully inspire people to, to go off and try new use cases. Um, uh, just to conclude, we will send uh, the uh, recording of the session um, as soon as it's available, along with the slides, so you can take a, a longer look. Um, and also, um, we've shared the benchmark report, but we can also share the PDF of the um, export. And I think finally, if you've got any questions, we'd love to hear them. Genuinely, we learn so much from the questions that you're asking, whether you're a customer or, or, or not yet a customer, feel free to reach out. Um, it, there's no such thing as a silly question. And, we, and as I said, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but that concludes um, another, another thank you there. That, that, includes, uh, that concludes today's session. Um, I think we're, we're right on time. So you've got seven minutes left. Uh, or back for your lunch time. So thanks very, very much and take care. Cheers, guys. Bye bye.